Welcome everyone. The Southern Alliance for Clean Energy is pleased to host the South Southeast Coastal Climate Network's webinar series. On behalf of SACE and the Southeast Coastal Climate Network, I want to thank you for being with us today. Your interest and support make our work possible. Before we get started today, I'd like to just take a moment to review the basic functions of the control panel on your screen. If you'd like to minimize your control panel so you can get a full screen view, just select the orange arrow in the left-hand corner and then select that again to bring it back up. To ensure sound quality, all of the attendee lines have been muted today, but we encourage you to participate and ask questions through typing them in the questions box on your control panel. We will answer any questions at the very end of the presentation. And now I'd like to turn it over to Chris Carnivale, SACE Coastal Climate and Energy Coordinator and the manager of the Southeast Coastal Climate Network. Chris? Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. My name is Chris Carnivale and I serve as the manager of the Southeast Coastal Climate Network. As you can see on the current slide, the Southeast Coastal Climate Network is a coalition of individuals and organizations spanning the coastal southeast who are working on coastal responses to climate change. We have members as far north as Maryland and as far west as Louisiana. The purpose of the network is to bring voices together, to trade information, and to synergize our efforts. The Southeast Coastal Climate Network is hosted under the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Our largest tool is our group site website, which is an online platform that enables members to send group emails, post discussion topics or relevant news to discussion boards, and use a shared group calendar. If you're interested in joining the network and using these tools, please just visit the web address on the screen now, seccn.groupsite.com, and click join this group now. For those of you on this webinar who are already members, I want to encourage you to use these tools to help get your message out. The purpose of the group is to encourage communication and collaboration, and you have a receptive group of people at your fingertips, so please don't be shy, and please do use these web tools. Another great tool we have is our webinar series, of which today's webinar is a part. Today we're joined by Jen Bennett Mintz and Dr. Scott Noakes for a presentation on ocean acidification, its impacts on the southeast, and strategies for effective communication about ocean acidification. I'll introduce you to our two speakers for today before handing the floor over to them. Jen Bennett Mintz coordinates outreach and education for NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program from Hollings Marine Laboratory in Charleston, South Carolina. Here she serves as a liaison between the research, education, and stakeholder communities by translating current ocean acidification research in a way that is relevant and understood by a variety of audiences. She earned her BS in Marine Biology at University of California, Santa Cruz, and her MS in Marine Biology from College of Charleston. She has done focused research on polar phytoplankton physiology and biogeochemistry in the Ross Sea off of Antarctica and was awarded the John D. Naus Marine Policy Fellowship. A surfer and outdoor adventurer, she spends as much time she spends as much time on the water as she can. Scott Noakes is a research scientist at the University of Georgia and works closely with NOAA to monitor the changes and effects of ocean acidification in the South Atlantic Bight offshore Georgia. He earned his BS in petroleum engineering at Mississippi State University and both an MS and PhD in marine science at the University of Georgia. Scott is in charge of the ocean acidification mooring at NOAA's Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, which is located approximately 20 miles offshore Georgia. The mooring, one of only two on the East Coast, is part of an international monitoring program administered by NOAA. In addition to the ocean acidification research, Scott is also the Director and Diving Safety Officer for the University System of Georgia Scientific Diving Program. With that, I will turn it over to Jen to get us started. Thank you, Chris, um, for the very nice welcome and introduction for both Scott and I. And Thanks to the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy and Southeast Coastal Climate Network for um, allowing us the opportunity to be here. We're really happy to be here speaking with you today about the other CO2 problem and hope that you will leave this webinar with a better sense of ocean acidification, the science around it, particularly what scientists here in the Southeast are learning, what people are doing about it, and a few things we have learned 
as far as effectively spreading the word or communicating about ocean acidification. Although scientists have been studying the relationship between carbon dioxide in the air and the ocean for many decades, the term ocean acidification <clears throat> was coined about 10 years ago. And since then, there has been intense research done to better understand the relationship between carbon dioxide in the air and oceans. And we've learned that with this fundamental change in ocean chemistry, there's quite a bit at stake. This is a, in a large part because the ocean is much like the heart of our climate. The winds, weather, and climate we experience on land is regulated by the oceans, just as our hearts regulate the flow of blood throughout the body. Half of the oxygen we breathe today was provided by the phytoplankton or microscopic plants in the ocean. Additionally, the ocean provides many outlets for recreation here in the southeast, whether it be kayaking, boating, heading out for a day of recreational fishing, and additionally, it contributes to our regional economy through commercial fishing efforts of Manhattan, Red Drum, croaker, crabs, albacore, bluefin, tuna, to name just a few. Although there are many potential impacts of ocean acidification, this change in the ocean chemistry is driven by one thing, carbon dioxide. Yes, carbon dioxide is emitted with every exhale us animals and humans <laughs> take. But since the Industrial Revolution, the amount of carbon dioxide humans have released into the atmosphere has increased 1.5 fold from about 260 parts per million to 400 parts per million due to the combustion of fossil fuels to run our cars, our boats, our planes, supply our homes with electricity. Additionally, land use change, such as deforestation and cement production, contribute to this increased amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. The carbon dioxide we release into the atmosphere is ultimately absorbed by our oceans. About a quarter of the carbon dioxide we emit ends up in our oceans. Carbon dioxide is often referred to as an acid gas because when carbon dioxide combines with seawater, it forms carbonic acid, shown here. <clears throat> carbonic acid quickly dissociates. It's not stable in seawater and forms two things, bicarbonate here and hydrogen ions. So this increase in hydrogen ions is where, as some of you may be familiar, we get the H in the pH scale, a measure of acidity. And this increase in bicarbonate actually creates less availability of carbonate for our shell building creatures seen here. So we see this decrease with the increase of bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. We see a decrease in pH or increase in acidity of the oceans. Now they're not acidic. <laughs> and we also see that real link to the biology with a decrease in the carbon and ion, which is a key building block for shelled organisms such as crabs, corals, oysters and also corals build their hard structures from this building block. So in short, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere through a series of pretty straightforward chemical reactions, <laughs> despite all the, the, the letters, causes an increase in hydrogen ions, which is where we get that term acidification. This is represented by that decrease in pH, that increase in acidity, and accompanying that increase in bicarbonate, we get the decrease in carbonate ions. And that depletion of the carbonate ion is where we get that link, and can, which can potentially make it challenging for those creatures that build shells and other bony structures to do so. <clears throat> One other layer of the ocean acidification puzzle is when we get close to our coasts. In recent years, scientists have learned that ocean acidification be, can be exacerbated by what we do on land. Things like stormwater runoff and fertilizer inputs can increase nutrient loads in our coastal waters. Freshwater inputs from storms can also exacerbate the acidification process and have effects on that carbonate chemistry, that key carbonate ion needed for those shell building marine organisms. What scientists are learning and continue to learn has sparked some concern for marine organisms and ecosystems that are vital to our well-being. 
<clears throat> Initially, studies focused on these shell building organisms such as clams, oysters, and found a variety of impacts such as reduced calcification rates, reduced growth, production, lifespan of larvae or young shellfish. Studies then began to look at, pardon me, <laughs> look at indirect effects, looking at those creatures that may not have shelled parts, but began to look at fish such as um, flounder and found that there can be altered ability to grow and survive in flounder and also took looks at fish such as clownfish and cobia here on the southeast and found an altered ability to um, detect prey and predators and just a general loss in sensory um, their ability to sense their environment. Additionally this whoo what happened there? <laughs> Additionally um, this beautiful pteropod, the sea butterflies, sort of become the canary in the coal mine for ocean acidification. This is a zooplankton creature that's at the base of the food web that has a thin shell and it's off of the west coast they found these shells already eroding due to more acidic waters that are upwelled onto the west coast shelf. <clears throat> So we've done all these experiments in the laboratory and found various results in shellfish, flounder, the plankton at the base of the food web. But what, there was also a big surprise about five years ago that took place outside of the lab, right on the west coast shelf. The Whiskey Creek, Whiskey Creek oyster hatchery production suffered large mortalities back in 2008. It's located in Willapa Bay, Washington. Hatchery owners, academic and NOAA scientists, did some monitoring and actually identified that it was this low pH upwelled water that was the, the cause of their larval loss. Some hatchery owners, such as those at Goose Point Farm, decided to move the operation to Hawaii. Others, those at Whiskey Creek, continued to work with scientists to monitor the water that comes into their hatcheries off of the coastal shelf. And they're actually able to now turn off the spigot, literally, when low pH waters are detected. This is estimated to have restored about $35 million back to the coastal communities in Oregon and Washington. In other regions of the U.S., such as the Northeast and Gulf of Maine, hatchery owners have also begun to note changes <clears throat> with fresh water flows. Although it hasn't been, the science has not been done to attribute this directly to ocean acidification, what they have found is that if they do put that carbonate chemistry in balance, so have that right balance of bicarbonate and carbonate ions and the right pH, they have a 100% success rate in their hatchery, allowing their larval, larval oysters to grow through that juvenile stage. Here in the southeast, there's been talk of a the formation of the Southeast Coastal Acidification Network to bring together scientists, industry decision makers to be begin to understand what the potential impacts here in the Southeast could be. <clears throat> if we head back out to the Pacific Northwest and look at those impacts, the governor of Washington back in 2012 actually decided to take this is a step further after seeing the loss at her at those state hatcheries. She formed a Washington State Blue Ribbon Panel on Ocean Acidification. This was really the first of its kind. It was a state level effort to address ocean acidification. And the panel was made up of a variety of folks, scientists, decision makers, industry, stakeholders, tribal representatives, and the conservation community. And their goal was to produce a set of comprehensive recommendations to deal with ocean acidification. The recommendations did come out a year later and there were quite a few ranging from reducing carbon footprints in general in the state and carbon emissions to reducing nutrient loading to lessen that effect of our coastal inputs into the acidification on the west coast. <clears throat> 
So this is a great example of what has been done at the state level to adapt to or begin to better understand and work towards adapting to this fundamental shift in our ocean's chemistry. The NOAA Ocean Acidific Acidification Program, quite a mouthful, <laughs> works on a national level. And there's six real focus areas, which you'll be hearing about one today. We focus on monitoring, just looking at the chemical changes in our ocean, getting those baseline measurements to understand those shifts. We also support biological and ecosystem response experiments in the lab, looking at both ecologically and economically important species. The data from both the, the chemical monitoring and the biological response experiments are of course managed <laughs> and they're also fed into models. Some of these models just working to predict what the chemistry of the oceans might look like and others linking going a step further to see what the economic impacts of ocean acidification may be in certain regions. Another focus area is looking at how we can adapt to the shift in our oceans. And of course, we educate and conduct outreach to raise awareness on ocean acidification as well. The monitoring aspect is done in a large part by hydrographic research cruises, shown here in blue. Volunteer ships of opportunity. And these are ships, commercial ships, that will put a pH sensor and carbon dioxide sensor in their hull so that we can get a baseline measurement of the chemistry in the ocean. And these often transect, as you can see here, from the west coast of America through the Pacific, some head down to South America. So really allow us to just begin to understand that chemistry in the oceans. The third tier of our monitoring program focuses on these stationary monitoring sites where again we measure pH and carbon dioxide, which Scott is going to dive into every three hours to get a better understanding of what's happening in both coastal and ocean waters. In the southeast in particular, we do conduct a research cruise every few years that travels all the way from the Gulf of Mexico around the Panhandle and up the east coast measuring these same chemical parameters to once again get a baseline understanding of what our oceans look like in regards to acidification. As I mentioned, the other part of what we do and what we support are these stationary monitoring sites. You can see in the southeast we have three sites, one over here in Mississippi, one down at the tip of Florida. It's a coral reef site, so we're looking at how the coral reef ecosystem may be impacted. And the third and final one, which you will hear from Scott just momentarily, is at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. And I'll turn it over to Scott now to share a bit more about what he's learning there. Okay, Jen gave a really good breakdown of what uh, the CO2 problem is and, and why we're interested in CO2 in the water. And as she mentioned, we have a network of monitoring buoys all around the coastal United States, all the way from the Gulf of Maine up in the very northeastern part of the United States, down through the southeast. We also have them along the west coast in California, up to Washington, around the coast of Alaska, Hawaii, and there's actually been a new one put in on the coast of Australia. So it's becoming, originally it was a United States, North America monitoring program, but it has expanded out to become more of an international one. PMEL ha currently has about uh, 20 coastal and coral reef moorings that we're collecting CO2 and other water quality data on. And as you can see, Georgia is the only uh, monitoring buoy in the South Atlantic Bight, which is the area 
from roughly South Carolina through North Georgia, this section that curves inward on the Atlantic Ocean. What we have at Gray's Reef, we're using one of the uh, National Data Buoy Center buoys. That they're one the ones that give you the, the weather data, the wave height, the wind speed, water and air temperature, atmospheric pressure that a lot of people are used to seeing. And instead of putting a separate buoy out there, we were able to modify their buoy to fit the PCO2 carbon dioxide sensors as well as put pH and water quality sensors on the buoys as well. This way we were able to make use of an existing platform and when they go out to do servicing on it we can tag along or we can take smaller NOAA vessels out to repair or change out sensors as needed. Now also at Gray's Reef we have a C4 platform that has has similar sensors on it. We monitor PCO2, temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, conductivity, salinity, pressure, turbidity, and chlorophyll. The reason we have put the seafloor sensors down there is we're very interested in what will happen to the benthic community as the CO2 in the water increases, which then decreases the pH. And we wanted to have sensors down there right at the same area where these organisms live. Now this data from the, the buoy is transmitted by satellite back to PMEL, the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, who is the main organizer of the buoy system. It's transferred to them every 24 hours so they can monitor the data that's coming off the buoy and tell whether things are functioning properly, if a sensor has failed, and they know that what happens to the data immediately. This way it's basically a real-time system to allow us to monitor what's going on on a continuous basis. Now this is a picture of what the seafloor platform looks like. We've got the uh, water quality instrument on the left. It does the dissolved oxygen, temperature, conductivity, salinity, pressure, turbidity, and chlorophyll. And this is an autonomous unit. It doesn't transfer data. We have to actually go down. It's in about 65 feet of water. We have to go down with divers to collect it so we can download the data. Typically we do that about every two to three months. We also have a SAMI CO2 system that is doing a high resolution PCO2 and it records temperature as well. We also have a high resolution pH sensor down there. So we're doing very similar measurements as what we see from the surface. And part of it is, one, as I said, we want to have it close to the benthic community, but we're also trying to determine the differences between surface CO2 and bottom CO2. From what we've seen over the last few years, most of the time they track fairly well but occasionally we have seen differences where seafloor CO2 would spike high and would not be represented by the surface. What we think is going on with that is that we're getting some influence from the Georgia rivers coming out and it is bottom water that's changing and we're not seeing it on the surface. So we're getting a feel for how will these organisms be affected by the changing of chemistry. Now this is a data plot. We started the CO2 monitoring at Gray's Reef in August of 2006 and currently we have workable data all the way through uh, 2013 into early 2014. It takes a few months to get the, the data that comes off the buoy to be run through the quality assurance programs to make sure the data is good. So we have good workable data through 2013. As you can see, there's a very cyclical effect. That It's a seasonal effect where in the summers the CO2 is high, in the winters it goes very low. And this has happened every year. And this is basically temperature driven. 
So what happens is the CO2 in the ocean reacts with the water to form dissolved compounds. Well, as the water cools in the winter, the ocean can hold more of these dissolved species, so the CO2 gas is actually drawn down, which is happening in the wintertime. The lows that you see is brought down and is converted into dissolved forms. But then as the water starts warming up in the summertime, the dissolved carbon species are converted back to CO2, and as you can see, it just continues going up till you reach around the middle of summer, then as the water starts cooling down, it goes back down again. And so we've seen this every year, and it's a very common thing in the shallower coastal areas. Now if you do some trend analysis on it, you can see very clearly that we have increasing amounts of CO2. This black line is representing the CO2 in the water. And over the seven years that we've been doing this, you can see there's a considerable increase in the water CO2. Now the green line represents the atmospheric CO2. It's still increasing, but much smaller increase than the seawater CO2. So if you break it down into numbers, what we've seen in the atmospheric CO2 is about an increase over the seven years of 21 parts per million. And that comes out to 0.77% per year. To put that into perspective of what other sites have seen, there's a station in Hawaii that has been monitoring atmospheric CO2 since the 50s. And their overall average they've seen 0.78% per year. So we're in the same ballpark of what's being seen on long-term monitoring. We've been able to determine that in the seven-year period. Now the average atmospheric CO2 from season to season, year to year, comes out to about 392 parts per million. Now the seawater CO2 increased by about 78 parts per million in seven years. That comes out to 2.7% per year. One big question that has come up is why has it increased so much more per year CO2 in the water versus in the atmosphere? Where is this CO2 coming from? Unfortunately, I don't have an answer, and I've asked this to many people, and we have yet to come up with an answer of where is this excess CO2 coming from at the Gray's Reef area. Now, other sites Worldwide, the seawater CO2 is expected to increase about 0.5% per year. So the Gray's Reef area is considerably higher. At the Gulf of Mexico site in the northeast U.S., they're seeing an increase of about 1.6% per year. So the Gray's Reef area, for whatever reason, has a much higher percent per year increase in seawater CO2. Now, on average, there's about 411.6 increase or average parts per million CO2 in the seawater. Now if you notice the atmospheric CO2 is 392 parts per million, that means that the area offshore Georgia where Gray's Reef is actually is an overall CO2 source. In other words, more CO2 is coming out of the water in that area than going in. Now if you go back and look at the plot, whenever CO2 is down low in the winter, it's taking in, it actually can take in atmospheric CO2 at this time. So CO2 is going into the water during the winter. Now in the summer when CO2 is high, it goes above that atmospheric level of about 400 and that's letting CO2 back out of the seawater. So it's a constant uh, reversal. During the winter, you have CO2 going into the water, and during the summer, you have CO2 coming back out. Now this is a classic case of what happens when CO2 in the seawater increases. It's shown in blue on this graph. 
and the pH will decrease. Now this is a seasonal effect at Gray's Reef due to the change in the water temperature and what I like about this one is this is also representation of what happens when CO2 increases over a long period of time the pH and the CO2 are tied directly together given the chemistry that Jen talked about earlier. Now Gray's Reef this is what happens in seven months. The PCO2 change is, was about 220 parts per million and the pH change was about 0.23. Now given worldwide they're anticipating that the ocean's pH will change roughly 0.1 on the pH scale. So Gray's Reef organisms are experiencing considerable change seasonally. On one hand that, that is really very lucky for the Gray's Reef area because these are very hardy organisms. Some of the organisms in the Florida Keys, for example, the corals, cannot handle a change of that nature. Their water temperature is fairly constant. They're used to everything being constant. The organisms at Gray's Reef experience this major change on a seasonal basis. So it tells us that some organisms are going to be able to handle the change and others are going to have a much harder time with it. This is just a general plot of some of the water quality that we monitor at Gray's Reef. Several things of, of interest on this plot. One, you can see the temperature change. How as it starts warming up, there's a considerable temperature change at Gray's Reef. And as I pointed out, this is what drives a lot of the chemistry change that's happening. And organisms at this area have learned to develop an immunity to it, they can handle the changes, which is, as I said, very lucky for Gray's Reef because as the chemistry changes, it's going to take a little bit longer for these organisms to feel impacted by the chemistry change. Now another part of interest is the salinity. In 2013, we were still experiencing a drought at the very beginning of the year. But in around the end of February, early March, suddenly the rain started coming and there was a lot of effect of fresh water going offshore. As you can see, the salinity dropped by several points by all this fresh water coming out. Now the fresh water also affects what the CO2 in the water is, can change the pH. So it, it tends to affect everything. It makes the Georgia area even more complicated than uh, out in the deep water ocean area. Now we also monitor chlorophyll and turbidity. The chlorophyll will tell us when we're getting algal blooms and that often affects the turbidity as well. But we saw many cases where turbidity and chlorophyll did not necessarily agree which tells us we were probably getting a lot of river input offshore. It's putting the high uh, organic matter and silt out there in the Gray's Reef area, which can affect the organisms by the water quality in general. Now the, the organisms at Gray's Reef, Gray's Reef is a very um, active biological area. It has a hard bottom reef where the organisms can attach and grow. There's a lot of uh, soft corals, not as many hard corals, but we do have some. One is the oculina. And these are the organisms that I suspect will be the first to be impacted as the, the CO2 continually increases and the pH decreases, that these organisms are going to have a harder time to deal with it, even though they have adjusted to live in the Gray's Reef area where pH and CO2 change constantly they're the ones most likely to be impacted. We are currently starting some experiments at the University of Georgia and Georgia Southern to look at oculina to see just how they will be affected with increased pH CO2 and the decrease in pH. It will take some time before we actually have real data to put behind this to see at what point they will be affected. 
But this is the next big step for us to determine how will the benthic community at Gray's Reef fare as the water quality changes. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Jen to do the follow-up. Thanks, Scott. So as we heard from Scott, there's some interesting things going on off the coast of Georgia, just physically, temperature, freshwater inputs, and we do have a huge estuarine influence here in the southeast, a lot of estuaries, a lot of rivers. And um, there, the extent of that freshwater flux may be a little further offshore than we could have foreseen <laughs> with Gray's Reef being that 20 miles offshore. As far as species here in the out in the southeast, um, I mentioned the Colbia study, um, an important recreational fish, and how um, their otoliths, their ear bones, have have shown to shift in laboratory experiments with with pH changing. And some other things to consider: we we do love our oysters and our crabs here. Um, shrimp also calcify as well. Um, coral and algae is another. Um, important species and down a bit further south in Florida those seagrass beds can actually be really important what we've learned is they can be really important habitats or sort of nurseries and actually buffer um, those coral reef organisms help protect them from any shifts like they may see daily or seasonally like like Scott showed at Gray's Reef these seagrasses once again absorb that carbon dioxide and increase the pH of the waters um, so those are just things that we can think about, um, you know, where we can hope that we have some research to, to better understand the impacts of ocean acidification and ultimately what our food web will look like down here um, in this region, in this ecosystem, and how that may impact our, our coastal communities and, and all those folks that enjoy either eating or, or recreating with these different species in these different ecosystems. And so although ocean acidification is, is quite complex, <laughs> we can see there's a lot of, um, of that chemistry that, um, you know, a lot of moving pieces there, a lot of um, different, different things to consider when looking at how organisms will be affected, what they're exposed to on a, a seasonal scale or a daily scale. Um, the good news is, is that we actually have <laughs> one thing <laughs> that is a clear opportunity. Um, I know we... I just want you guys to take a take a gander at what percent of um, of U.S. citizens are actually aware of ocean acidification, and you can just sort of note that in your head: seven, twelve, or thirty-one <laughs> percent. And for those of you that said thirty-one percent, that is love the optimism. <laughs> That's where we'd love to be. Um, as of 2011, seven percent of the U.S. was actually aware of ocean acidification. That is that it is happening. Um, it's happening now and so the the estimate for the amount of people that know today is about 12 percent and the real opportunity not just lies in how many people um, have yet to learn or hear about ocean acidification but um, this this public opinion poll found that if folks were simply told about ocean acidification basically here's ocean, ocean acidification here's what it is a bit about um, similar to what we shared in the first few slides, 50% um, of those people perceive it as a threat to ocean health, a pretty important threat, um, or big threat, I should say. And that says a lot, because we've had this climate change conversation now for, for many decades, and the number of folks that consider climate change a threat is right about 51%, or it was in this poll back in 2011. So raising awareness about ocean acidification is really offers us something unique in that not many people know about it and if they simply hear about it and hear what it is they're concerned um, and perhaps ready to take action and this is just one of the things we've learned there's a community of educators and scientists communicators um, not just within NOAA but within aquariums and zoos and parks um, throughout the nation that are working together knowing the things we we learned back in 2011 we've held workshops and all sorts of things to get at how can we effectively communicate knowing that there's 
a lot of folks who are not aware of this problem and that if they do hear about it, um, we have the opportunity to really inspire action. And so this group I mentioned of educators and scientists or communicators are, are focusing on effective ways to communicate and we're, we're thinking about how we can speak with different audiences, whether that's elementary school kids or families, um, how to message, what messages work, what metaphors work when we're talking about ocean acidification. Um, there's folks monitoring the social media um, discussion around ocean acidification. Um, another group is looking at um, sort of sifting through OA literature and there is about three new scientific studies every day but are there any of these scientific studies that can be used as stories or case studies to share with, with um, these audiences we're interested or those folks that don't know about ocean acidification um, like the clownfish who, who can't find his, his way home under those low pH conditions you know and, and Nemo people, people know that so there's a group of folks that are really working together um, and we have some lessons learned not only from the climate change conversation but what we've been learning in the past few years. Um, so I'm just going to share a few, uh, just a tidbit of those, those principles um, that we can apply and ideas for communicating about ocean acidification science. So one thing we've learned is that um, it's best to avoid using the term acid ocean. <laughs> this can bring up all sorts of, of um, images in folks' heads. <laughs> um, our, our ocean as, a, as, as an acidic soup and um, this ties into a, a sort of negative way to start the conversation um, and so we also want to avoid speaking to folks in a way that may cause them to tune out and that can be um, speaking in a way that um, you know doom and gloom this is the end of the world we're, we're not going to be able to do anything about it um, or talking to them in a way that makes them feel like they're solely responsible for for putting the carbon dioxide in, into the atmosphere and it ending up in the ocean um, and what we found is that um, people want to be offered solutions that that are on scale with the problem which some folks figure the scale of this problem is pretty big um, and that's why we go back to sort of starting with um, that motivation so we want to establish the role and importance and function of the ocean and you heard a few of those things if you're not familiar um, that ocean being that primary driver of weather and climate that that heart um, of our climate um, the ocean is also a source of clean fresh water. Most of the rain that falls on land comes from the tropical ocean and originated there. Um, those phytoplankton, those microscopic plants that live in the ocean are responsible for half of the action we're breathing today. Um, so these are just sort of establishing that um, there is something important and that can really lay down the, the foundation for motivating folks to take, take action. Um, and this next one may be a, a bit um, a bit surprising to folks and it's not all um, not done all the time but what we've learned is it's actually most effective to distinguish ocean acidification from climate change when talking about it um, climate change there's been a long conversation um, there's a lot of um, uh, political political ties and um, just history and sort of models in folks heads about what climate change is and it, it can get a little a little fuzzy for folks with um, with the many greenhouse gases and this this solar blanket this trapping of heat um, and what we found and what we mentioned earlier is that when people hear about ocean acidification it's one gas it's carbon dioxide we're clear where that gas comes from and we know the chemical reactions and and people get that they seem to really grasp that and um, are concerned and, and that is where it really opens the door for us to to inspire inspire action um, and this is where we have the opportunity to really let um, folks know that they have a role to play um, and we talked about um, you know challenging folks to to offer solutions on scale with a problem and it's not to say that what you can you can offer those individual solutions um, biking to work, using public transportation, those sorts of things to lower your individual carbon footprint. But what we found is really asking folks to engage at the community level and that bigger picture you can see 
here on the bottom, this is a whole neighborhood um, over in the UK that actually got together to um, buy a large group of solar panels at, at a lower price so that they could all run off of solar energy instead. And of course this isn't um, available everywhere, but it is just a, an option and, and really engaging at the community level, reaching out to your neighbors in your neighborhood. That not only are people inspired, but they have automatically this, this, this support group, this connection that can really help us um, implement some solutions to reducing our carbon footprint. Um, the next thing is, is, and we sort of touched on this, but you know, leaving folks with some outcomes and, and solutions, um, you know, leaving them with a bit of hope. You know, we have the story of what happened in Washington State with the governor there working with his hatchery owner. You can see this is the owner of that Whiskey Creek, Whiskey Creek hatchery that lost their oysters. And, and that was something that started with an oyster farmer and is now being implemented on a state level. Um, you know, that's that's something people are doing. We also have um, these these great stories of folks um, taking that concept of a sort of a, a barn raiser and, and instead taking a day or two to green somebody's house in the neighborhood. Again, engaging on that community level, um, bringing your neighbors together and um, helping somebody to reduce that carbon carbon footprint. Um, one house, one house at a time, but with that that community gathering around that. There's also a ton of options. You know, folks are really trying to be creative and innovative. This is a picture of um, a kelp forest out on the west coast. They're they're proposing. They're thinking about building kelp gardens um, in the coastal waters to help absorb some of that carbon dioxide. Now that would just be a local local scale solution. Um, it, you know, it depends on on where you are on the coast and and what ecosystem you're working to protect. Um, but really, you know, offering the solutions and sharing these stories of, of people that are taking action is, is really effective um, when communicating about ocean acidification. Um, and so this was the one takeaway. We've sort of, we've, we've um, this group that has been working together for the past few years, use simple messages to demonstrate that ocean acidification is real and happening now, like we've seen in the Pacific Northwest, like we know the water. And a little bit of hope inspired to, to do something. Um, so we're informing, we're, we're letting folks know this is a, a, a great graphic that shows what they're learning at Gray's Reef, the chemistry and what that buoy that Scott shared so much about is doing so just the basics of ocean acidification what it is what it's um, what it may be impacting and then inspiring inspiring folks to take action this can be again reducing carbon dioxide emissions maybe in some places it's reducing that nutrient runoff um, like they're doing in Washington State that can exacerbate um, acidification in those coastal waters um, here's a various amounts of phytoplankton being grown again those those photosynthetic creatures that absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere this can go into those kelp um, for us as well for the West Coast you know and um, a lot of folks have spoken about it out about needing more research and monitoring to better understand this Scott mentioned there's just one buoy here in the southeast um, and there's a lot more to learn learn here and so you know speaking out about um, the need to better understand how the, the chemistry of our oceans is changing. Um, here we see the um, informing, educating stakeholders, the public, decision makers. Again, this is this is the hatchery owner, Bill Mook, over here on the right, talking to a governor, um, a variety of people um, right here. And we really, you know, just knowing that there's a community working on this um, and coordinating to focus around how we can effectively talk about ocean acidification and, and the science accurately to a wide variety of audiences. And so we hope you're, you're now aware of some of the lessons learned, um, not only in how to um, effectively communicate a bit about ocean acidification, but perhaps a bit more comfortable with the science. Um, and just remember that simply by informing people about ocean acidification, we can raise that number from what it is now, maybe one out of nine to two, three, or five people being aware. Um, and with that increased awareness, there's increased 
concern and that opportunity to really inspire actions and, and um, change behaviors, whether it be at the individual, community, or state level. So thank you, and I think we're opening it up for questions. Great. Thank you, Jen, and thank you very much, Scott. That was a great, great couple of presentations. Um, just a reminder for the audience, we are taking questions via the chat box on your control panel on the right hand side of the screen. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in and uh, we will try to get those answered for you. So first question, um, this was uh, submitted by a high school teacher who's interested in referencing some data and reports for her environmental science class, but it's equally applicable to everybody. Do you have a website or some sort of data portal where folks can get some of this information? Yes, there's actually all of the buoy information from every site that PMEL has they can go to the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab website and from there they can download the data from each buoy. And this is open to the entire public. So they don't need any particular password to get in. Just go to that website and they should be able to find the data from the different buoys. And we can also, just adding to that, some folks have taken the data and um, it's, there's an ocean acidification in the classroom module that has taken some data from the coral reefs off of Florida, that Chica Rocks buoy we, um, we showed, um, and has actually made some lessons around um, that real-time data as well. So we cool. can, I guess, send those resources if, in a follow-up email or... Um, yeah, if folks are interested, those websites where you can find those resources, both the PMEL, the live streaming data, and the ones that have built that data in the classroom module as well. Great. Okay, second question. Does ocean acidification interact with other environmental stressors, such as warmer ocean temperatures, water pollution, or habitat loss or degradation? Yes, those, those plots that I showed how the, the CO2 is directly affected by water temperature. As the water temperature increases, so does the CO2 in the water. So as, as our, globally, as our water temperatures increase, we will have more CO2 in the water, which then drives the chemical equations, which ultimately determine what the water pH is. So yes, water temperature is a big factor in the seawater CO2 problem. Yeah, and as far as marine pollution, um, we touched on that a bit. Out in Washington State, they did find, and there have been studies, that that nutrient runoff from sewage treatment plants um, does exacerbate, um, drive down that pH. Um, basically, by le lessening the amount of that, that buffering, that sort of protective balance um, in those chemical equations and so um, that is uh, you know scientifically and what the research has shown is that does exacerbate there hasn't haven't been studies here in the southeast as far as I know um, and particularly looking at that but at the same time on from a communications perspective we've also learned that talking about marine pollution um, to folks when people hear the word pollution they think um, the, the action, sort of the mental model, they go right to recycling. And so if we are going to be talking about um, nutrient runoff, um, you know, tying that back to that carbon dioxide is important to inspire those, those larger actions if that's what you're looking to do. Okay, great. How does nutrient loading increase acidity? Scott, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Uh, you go ahead if you have a good answer. I don't have yeah, one. Yeah, I'll try to break it down to simply. It, it's, it's not, um, what it basically does is, is lessen the buffering capacity of that system. So it's not that it directly um, drives down pH per se, but that sort of store of the carbonate ions um, and the bicarbonate, that, that part of the equation 
is shifted a bit so that buffer capacity is lessened um, with an increase in nutrients. And we can dive in. I'm happy to give you more information via email if you want to contact me about that as well. Okay, great. So many scientists say that in order to stave off catastrophic climate change, we need to stabilize atmospheric carbon dioxide at 350 parts per million. But seeing how water carbon dioxide increases more than atmospheric carbon, does that goal seem accurate? Um, or do you think that that goal of 350 parts per million uh, is factoring in the rate of increase of ocean acidification? I think the first, that the, the starting point needs to be curbing what we're putting into the atmosphere. To try and set a goal at any value, any level, is going to be very ambitious. Our, our main thing, goal should be we need to curb what goes into the atmosphere first, and then we can start looking at what could it be brought down to. But we are still putting enormous amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere, which is going into the ocean. A large part of it, anyway, is going into the ocean, which drives what the ocean chemistry becomes. So my concern isn't so much setting a goal that we need to bring atmospheric CO2 down to, but just working out ways to reduce what we're putting into the atmosphere. Yeah, and just to, to add to that a bit, I think the, the other factor there is the oceans work on a different time scale. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that upwelled water they're seeing on the Pacific coast is, is um, from 50 or 100 years ago, and, and it, it depends on where you are. And so thinking about that, I, I think ultimately the oceans will rebound, but it's just, a, it's a, you know, if we do curb um, or set that goal, but the time scale and, and who's going to be around for that bounce back is, is the real question, I think. Okay, great. Um, we have more questions than we have time to answer. Let's do one last question, and I apologize to anybody who submitted questions that we don't have time to answer, but let's end on this one. Um, can you talk a little bit about the impacts of ocean acidification on commercially important species? You'd mentioned flounder as one. Um, how about impacts to snapper and grouper or, or shrimp? Um, so that's a great question. The reason I mentioned flounder is because the research has been done <laughs> on them in the laboratory. Um, unfortunately, at this point, I am not aware um, of any studies that have been done on snapper and grouper, um, although they're extremely important down here. And um, as far as shrimp, there's been a lot of um, looks or uh, research done at shrimp in the estuaries where they do experience this um, some higher levels of carbon dioxide and lower pH naturally, um, but there hasn't been, as far as I'm aware, studies on those either in this region. I'm, I'm sad to say. <laughs> yes, there's, there's room for a lot of research on the different <laughs> organisms. We're yeah. really just getting into what organism will be affected as the water quality changes. Okay, great. Well, thank you both so much for your presentations and for answering the questions. Um, I'll turn it back over to Aaron to close this out. Thanks, Chris. Um, thank you, Jen and Scott. That was a great presentation. And thank you, everyone, on the call for attending today's Southeast Coastal Climate Network webinar. We have recorded today's presentation, and it will be available on the webinar archive page of the SACE website, and that's cleanenergy.org. You will also receive a follow-up email in, in the next couple of days with a link to the recording, and I think we'll also be able to include um, the sites that Jen had referenced in her presentation as well. So thanks again, and we hope you'll all join us next time.